Cool. Cool. And um, I can add bits on at the end if you want, Alison. Just ask me the question. <laughs> I don't know what we missed out. Um, and in terms of the platform, so we're science driven. I think, again, this is really important. We have our own in house data scientist, scientists. So we do all the analysis and the development side is done by our research and epidemiological team. That's really important. So we have that experience, not just collecting data, how to collect data, the best way to do it. And that also then helps when we look at the de defining these data dictionaries to ensure we collect the right data. And we call them CDEs, common data elements. Again, I'll touch on that in a, in a, very shortly about how we go about that process and make it really specific to the disease or therapeutic carrier that, that we're creating a registry for. The whole collaboration, and I don't know, I mean, Alison knows this from the years of working together, I'm really about collaborative approaches to work. You shouldn't be working in silos. Everyone should be trying to work to, together to kind of accelerate everything moving forward. So we bring together KOLs, advocacy groups, researchers, data partners, everyone involved in a, in a specific disease or therapeutic area to work together. So with that, we will create scientific boards when we set up registries, we get steering committees. We make sure that it isn't just one group or one individual leading the way, that it's a real collaborative um, effort, because that means you get the buy-in from the wider community, get much better data, and it actually gives it a bit more of a, a high reputation because everyone is on board. That just means we can then expand out, collect more data. If you're going into sites as a register develops or people at kind of a sightless virtual model, get more stakeholders, more data sources, we can ingest data from multiple registries that already may exist. But this doesn't need to be to be done at day one. This can be done, you know, in one year, two years, three years time. We identify it, then we ingest it, and we bring in those KOLs into the registry. As I mentioned before, we global presence. So for us, there is no limit on regions. We're compliant with all the requirements there, and also we can translate everything, and that's really important. We just make sure we have a high, highly structured governance structure in place again from day one. This allows us to understand who and what is going to be using the data and where it's going to be used. Again, it's not just one individual leading the way. It is a group of people making that decision together. So it can enhance the kind of quality of data you're sharing. Sorry, I mean- Daniel, it, Daniel, can I just interrupt? Two things course. so far in terms of jargony things that I'm not familiar with. What's a KOL and what's yes. a synthetic cohort? So KOL is your key opinion leader. So that's um, looking at all of the experts in the field. So with that, I mean, that can be, um, researchers, clinicians, advocates, we bring them together. So a synthetic cohort is essentially, um, whenever a clinical trial, you can create essentially like a placebo arm or comparable arm of people based on real world data. So they don't exist as the trial's happening and using historical data to, to define it essentially. That's a synthetic co co cohort. And that's really important in the really kind of rare Kind of a terminal where you can't afford to be doing um, placebo um, trials. You you really need to get everyone on the drug at the first first moment. So just to touch on this again, I'll share these slides. You can read this in a bit more detail. But a lot of work was done by Pulse to look at real world data, trying to understand, you know, what are the pitfalls, where is inadequate, where are the pain points, and one of the things that's really come out is looking at there's a lack of scientific expertise. EMA scraping, and by that term we mean going around collecting data from multiple sources to kind of retrospectively, just is, is insufficient. You need to be catching retrospective and prospective data. We call it ambispective. So you can have that brought together and there's no real lack of an end-to-end -end solution. You can get a provider who does retrospective, provider who does prospective, and they'll do it in different ways, but the data you then get out of it is then structured in very different ways. So you spend a lot of time merging and bringing it together. So really what, what was needed is a platform that can do both and provide it in that regulatory ready format. And this is what we've, we've noticed over the years is real world data has been low quality. There's, oh, there's many gaps and that's the issue for the FDA. It's too narrow. Again, depending on where you're getting that data from, it could be focused on one area. We always hear the word siloed, data stored in databases held by clinicians or by industry, no one's willing to share it or they only publish off it when they're ready to publish. So again, there's, um, there's examples of um, some rare diseases having been providing data for five, 10 years, and it's not been used yet because the clinician never, has never got around to writing that data up. What you need to do is make sure it is accessed and is used. And also, unfortunately, data gets lost. 
clinicians, if they're held in a clinician-based registry, move on to a different area. Um, and no one has access to it. This actually happened to us in um, Germany with a Sandhoff registry. So Tay-Sachs and Sandhoff are very similar disease and the, the clinician unfortunately died, but no one had access to his data. So we lost something like 20 years worth of, of natural history data. So yet that again has to be avoided so we can make sure we keep all that data in that one place so it can be used appropriately. And this is what we've started to look at as an organization is looking at scientific rigor, collaboration, how that success can be done. So defining that strategy, thinking about where you want to get to with data. So not where you are now, but what the future will hold. So what you can do now in terms of building blocks and planning, can you pay dividends when you move forward in five, six, seven years time, for example, if you have um, treatments coming, you know, have you done the groundwork beforehand? There's, you don't want to be going back on yourself to try and, and collect things. So we can help with that kind of planning and strategy is really important. And again, I mentioned before that collaborative approach. In terms of, of um, Pulse, a lot of the work we do, literature reviews, methodology support, we do our own house statistical analysis with our data science team. We're, we're like big advocates for reporting and publications. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of the writing up of the publications with our team. We've got 200 plus publications under our belt as an organization anyway. And that again is really, really important to get everyone on board so we can use the data, publish it, get it out there and it interests industry. Again, this is an approach that we've used on the rare, rare disease side in tay Sachs is to get industry involved is to use data we've collected in our registry. And it's actually been enabled us to get things moving forward much quicker than we'd ever thought would be possible. So I'll stop there with any questions before I move on to data collection within our platform. No. Okay. So evidence generation and drug development process, there's all these different stages that go along. And when we talk about an end-to-end -end solution, end-to-end -end solution is something that can work here at the preclinical stage and also at the approval and reimbursement, but there are very different technologies involved in these. And what we're able to do with our platform, as I mentioned before, is provide the modules that allow you as the drug development process moves in one drug to add those in within the system. So we can do all that preclinical work, doing the natural history data, engaging the stakeholders, bringing people into the platform, starting off small the contact database and expanding that out. Working on protocol reviews, recruitment, again, very important. We have partners we work with on that side, helping the site setups and developing clinical endpoints. Again, really important, that's something that is going to be really important for all of us as we move forward how we can do these and digitize some of these as well and then we look at the trial side with the data and then uh, distributing the information that's collected we can provide the ability to um obviously download the, the anonymized data which you can then use for reports but also we can give data back to patients so they can see their own information and also those of their peers we can do the identified reports on you know disease progression where they're based so they can see that actually there's a wider community i think it's really important that you have to give patients something back if you're going to be if you're asking them for something and one thing we get asked a lot is interacting with, with patients and i mean you're all advocates like myself so you will know that we're all happy to do something for explain what it is and what we're going to get out of it what we don't want to do is just go here's my data and that's it you don't hear anything it's really important that something coming back. Is it going to be information about clinical trials? Is it information about themselves and their community? And that's something we really focused on our dashboards to make sure that we can bring that back to the patient so that they can see that, that information. So I mentioned before this module, modular kind of platform is cost effective as well. So we have industry we work with and also advocacy, and there's a kind of a different pricing structure we have in place. So what we tend to do, especially on the rare side, is look at developing these kind of contact databases that we can then develop forward into the patient portal. So they can do PROs. We can do those in any, any shape, way, form, you know, um, questionnaires. It's all mobile responsive or, or um, the desktop. We can capture consent, obviously, and we capture consent via DocuSign, which again is very important. So we have all the audit trials there, the natural history data, we can do the, the clinical disease data and the research portal. Depending upon your own kind of movement is what, what modules you add onto the registry. And what we tend to do with the kind of the rarer 
um, all the advocacy groups is we will start with something and then we'll get industries to sponsor those developments as we go on. So we have a kind of a sponsorship model where we will bring in those industry partners to get them to develop the registry on, on further once we have that framework in place of that simple contact database that has some of the CDEs, which is specific to either the disease or to the therapeutic area. And then as the platform develops on, we can bring in data. So one thing we can do is we can be linked to other disease registries to ingest the data. We can be linked to wearables, and obviously patient generated data directly from the registry. We can then bring in data from claims and billing. Again, not so relevant for us in the UK, but globally, that's another important step that we can then ingest into the system to then um, use the information that's stored. And that can then be used to access clinical trials, optimal endpoints and trial design and things like that. And what we like to look at here is then how you utilize that data. So again, what goes in has to come out. It's not just a storage point. It's something that can be used to develop forward uh, what you want within that therapeutic area. When we look at the ingestion of data, this is where we will pull data from any kind of source. For example, another existing clinical registry. We'll ingest it, we create it. This is where we look at mapping it to the data dictionary that's been defined by the, by the group who's managing this kind of steering committee. We harmonize it. This is where we start to match it up. So for example, naming convention is a big one. People name things differently in terms of the, the symptom. So we just make sure it all matches up the same, harmonize it and then we can match it, and then we can provide the insights. And from those insights, you then get your dashboard, you then get your analytical reports and things like that, which again, allows you to bring in the data from the other sources and, and, and have it as one rather than multiple different um, registries kind of bring the data in yourself. And this, this slide's a bit complex in terms of what it shows, but what we're trying to put here is to show that we can ingest that retrospective data by our, our science, data science team. We can bring it from all these different sources, map it according to what needs to be mapping, and then identify, harmonize, and then it can all come out within ECRFs, EPROs, things like that. So it's a, it's a complex slide. It basically just shows you we can pull in data from these multiple sources and then ex explain that out. When I mentioned CD, so these are the common data elements, this is what we do. So this is again why we're talking today, was that the old way tended to be that you'd have one registry for each disease or each indication, and then you would go out and collect data from one platform for one disease, which is becomes very disease specific, also becomes very expensive. What we're able to do is we're able to bring in multiple conditions into one platform. So you can have that one kind of database. We can look at those data elements across neuroepilepsy and then disease specific, then common. And what we can do then is provide single access points into the same database. So you're collecting all of them in one place. What this does is one, it reduces cost because you're not paying for five, six, seven, eight registries. You're paying essentially for one. The database can, can be defined across commonalities across all conditions plus disease specific ones. We're actually able to do you know, provide different landing pages. So if you're coming from Ring20, from CDKL5, Rep, wherever, you have your own um, landing page with your own resource center to provide the ability to upload information. When it goes into the database, we can then start matching things up to look at uh, the commonalities. So here, it's very important we can then use that data when we speak to industry. So industry can then be looking at the data that's collected. It kind of makes everyone a bit more attractive because the patient numbers have increased. And this is what we're looking at trying to do for more of the kind of the rare groups. So uh, lysosomal storage disorders, for example, how can we bring them more within one registry to collect the, the commonalities, but also disease specific. And from that, we're hopeful that we can we bring in more, more industry. Underproofing all of that is the governance structure. Again, that's really important. We have, we have um, steering committees and scientific advisory board, and this is made up of the KOLs of advocacy we rotate them around so you don't get someone who will sit on a board for you know, five, six, seven years. It rotates on one year or two year terms to keep it fresh and to make sure that the mission of what you want to achieve for the registry is clearly defined as well. This really again really helps to make sure that you're publishing off the data that's kept and you're keeping an understanding of funding sources, the priorities and refining what data is captured within the system. And then when we look at our rare central product, this is where I spoke to Alice and we kind of have these three forms, you've got the rare central starter, which realistically is just more a 
I would say more like a contact database for one therapeutic area. There's a you can do some generic problems that's based off kind of a data dictionary we've already defined. That's the price in there is very low end. And what we do here is to look to accelerate them on to it to speak with pharma to look at sponsoring those future developments. I would say what we're looking here with you guys is if we would did something like uh, accelerated program, it means we can um, capture those CDEs for epilepsy, but also the disease specific ones within the database. And we can expand it out and attract in pharma. So we have the library of information and stuff like that, which would be really, really important. And then the idea would be to, to develop it on when we get industry sponsorship to then add in these additional modules, depending on their involvement, the treatments that are out there and what data they want to capture. The key here is to reduce the cost for advocacy and anything that comes in from industry goes via revenue shares and stuff like that. And that's a kind of a model we've looked at and used successfully. For example, we did um, for a chronic kidney disease in the US with the CKD registry, which been very successful. And in fact, we've then off that had the, the main CKD registry, then we have Alport, which is a rare um, kidney condition that kind of sits underneath it. So what we want to do is enable people to really take control of information they've got or can store and use it with industry and keeping it stored and structured in the right format. Um, and then just to touch on very briefly kind of the system itself, uh, let me get to this one. So this, you can just about see, this is for example, the, the kind of custom dashboards we have is patient demograph demographics, completion stats. This all goes back to the patient or depending on your role, your admin role. So we can uh, use profile depending on whether you're an advocacy or site manager, whether you're just the patient, and then we define what data goes back. These are just graphs and graphics that you can then learn from um, being part of the registry. Again, which is really important. The data doesn't go into a black hole. It comes back to you in some way or format. And that's where we have the steering committee and the advisory board to work out exactly what information we share back to those who are taking part in the registry itself. I mentioned before it's um, responsive. So it can be mobile, tablet, or desktop. You just need a, a Wi-Fi or 4G connection. Um, that tends to work better, better than having a native app. With a native app stored on your phone, you have to have push in the data out and stuff like that. This just means that we can get real-time data straight away. And then it can be um, into the databases. And then this is our integrated patient portal. So I mentioned before, we can have this all branded depending on colors, logos, um, content it's all specific to each individual disease plus a generic one they're very opening page as well kind of the world's your oyster here because you can define define it and make it look any way you want it to look so it can fit your um charity branding and the look and feel so you want to make sure it's nice and seamless so you don't end up um confusing patients when they go into the registry that it looks completely different to what they're used to in terms of logos and colors and from that, that's it in terms of just an intro to, to Pulse. Any questions? Yeah, that there looks really interesting. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, that looks all great. What, what are the areas that you're um, working on to develop at the moment or you want to be working in a better way than they currently are? In what sense? In just the whole, the, you know, the whole process there, where are the areas that, you know, you want to further develop at the current time to make it a more sort of robust whole process? Or are you happy that it's all working exactly as it should? I think for us, the, the real area we want to start working on is how we can engage better with advocacy to get them on board. So from those early stages and define that process much better to bring them on as a starter accelerator and rare central and then working out the next steps we need a lot a lot of work on that side of things working with advocacy to kind of understand where they're looking to go to and that would then help us in terms of our roadmap as a product we've got lots of things in the pipeline linking up to different um, wearable vendors and things like that but we also need to make sure we have the right uh, groups involved in be that industry or advocacy to make that Kind of financially worth the company's while to do. On top of that, we're working, we're looking at trying to work with a couple of companies who have um, the ability to recruit people into registries, which would be very cool. So it's finding those hard to reach people. So not 
generally in the UK, but more kind of like in Africa or in Asia, are those strategies you can put in place to collect their data, but then how you can actually reach them. So it's working out that, that kind of strategy is going to be really important as a lot of these registries grow out. And the other thing we're looking at doing, again, with another partner is developing that kind of, I showed you that portal that has all the information, but actually there's, there are some people who kind of make a, got like a mini Facebook, but it's, it's kind of a community-based page that sits within the registry. Again, that's where you can share much more information. It gives people the ability to log into a system where they feel safe and secure to share. And we will have Facebook groups and things like that, but this um, would be much more specific. And um, we're looking at trying to develop in that within the platform as well, which I think will be successful, but it's kind of finding the right community for us to, to launch that with first off, because it's one of those, if we launch with the wrong group or the wrong community who won't engage with it, it would be kind of a waste of everyone's time so to make sure we, we work with the right partner there. I think it's really interesting from my perspective, um, sort of thinking one with a Ring20 hat on and then one with that wider, what about the other UK rare epilepsy groups? Um, so, I'm really kind of interesting. I, you know, you and I talk so much, have done over the years about this collaborative, you know, being collaborative, and and I I I like the concept of the collaborative model, um, and I see great advantages for many groups of that, and even for people with really rare diseases where there is no patient group or no patient advocacy, you know, the potential for their contact data to be captured to say they have xyz epilepsy um and so I, I think there's huge potential i think uh, what i'm really interested to understand is some of as you know some of the rare epilepsy groups do have existing registries a couple of them with yourselves um and others with other providers and etc cetera, etc cetera. And then there are groups like us at Ring20 that have no registry and many, many groups. And then there's, pe there's people with the other rare epilepsies that don't have anything at all, don't even have a group representation. And how I'm kind of, I'm really kind of interested. It's a shame that some of the others that said they were going to join today are not here um, to feed in, to input to this um, conversation, see how this might work. Um, I think a couple of things spring to my mind. One is around what would you suggest would be a good way to start given that we have this mixed model, existing model across many of the UK rare epilepsy organisations um, that would benefit groups, I guess, like us at Ring20, where, there's, where we do have, um, you know, we've got our own databases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not formal registry data, but, you know, we have lists of our, our families that we're in contact with, but they're not formally recorded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm conscious there are a number of groups like us that would just like to be able to get established, to have a formal basic, basic registry, mm -hmm. something to start from, um, with the opportunity to potentially ingest or align or um, whatever with, with existing registries such as the CDKL5, the DRAPAs, those, the other yeah. large groups that have got something out there potentially to join up the dots. Um, you know, what's the possibility of, does, does that sound like a sensible idea of a roadmap? And if that does, what are the sorts of costs associated with the groups that would want to start out? Because I know you mentioned about the potential sort of industry sponsorship when you start to get to sort of the accelerated model. Um, but, you know, how do you get on that first base? Yeah. So let's go to question one. Sorry, Sorry. there was a whole load. <laughs> no, no, is it that my suggestion is to look at it in, like you said, the bigger picture. So to get set up in some way to, to collect data, the problem is, and I, again, I've seen this through my years in advocacy, lots of patient groups kind of sitting on the fence, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to collect data. And then either it doesn't happen or industry sets up the registry. 
in which case the chances of you getting access to that information for it to be used you know it's 50 50 you could get a good industry partner is willing for you to manage that and hand it to you that's going to be very rare Having acts like those other registers that exist exist for a reason. And so, for example, CDKL5, you can look at um, looking at their data set, understanding what they capture. Those CDEs are defined already. Can they just be used? Why not? I know that there was a group, a combined brain, I mentioned it before, we're looking at trying to define um, kind of CDEs for, um, for, for epilepsy in the US. I'm not sure how far Terry Joe got with it. That's a big kind of part of the project we would do to get these common data elements down on paper and an agreement with the steering committee with all, all the kind of different groups we'll be working with. Because that then allows us to have something that when you go to industry, it's then you're not looking at just one disease, you're looking at all of these diseases, which can actually be very powerful. You know, basket trials. The basket trial we did with um with Tay Sachs with, with Nima picking an ataxia, we picked out a symptom. And that has been a successful study. And I think that's the kind of where we should start to be looking to move to anyway. And that's a whole other conversation for a bicycle trial approach, just because you get more patient numbers and you can actually get something that can impact more people across, across disease. This would allow you to do it essentially, because you'd have that common information and data that could be um, analyzed together in the registry. The key here is to work out which groups would be interested. Horizon scanning in terms of industry, are they interested? You know, what are the, ther what are the therapies out there at the moment? What's moving forward? And then looking at a model to set it up. And if we're looking at just defining it, common CDEs um, across all the conditions, plus a few disease specific ones, which you'd have to do anyway. But I mean, and as we talked about this before, Tay Sachs, again, the kids suffer from epilepsy and there are just different types of seizures they have. But they're all the same and actually the kids tend to suffer from all of them anyway at different points of their life so we can define it quite nicely i think within the registry and then you have all this information and data that can be utilized and then you can look at developing it out and then we talk about the roadmap this is where again where the steering, the steering committee can really help drive that forward what is the roadmap i would say just like off the top of my head a roadmap is start with three four five conditions patient portal CDEs, a few disease specific ones, that's it, you launch. You don't spend, you know, three, four, five years planning it. You get the committees appointed, you get the funding in place and you launch and you have this data because once you have information, <laughs> you're so much more interested in the pharma. They start thinking, okay, and actually the benefit you'll have, which again, what we didn't really have in, in Taste Sachs is you have it all structured and usable. So it's not going to be a case of someone can export it into Excel. So here you go. You have a completely structured data set in a format that's regulatory ready. That's the big, the big difference. And then you can look at um, moving forward and getting them to sponsor the developments and bringing them in on the, on, the, on the kind of drug development side, but not doing anything. I think what I've seen over the years is that some providers will offer you the world and give it to you and then they walk away because this is a tech provider. Some will offer you just minimal, no support, like the you know, pin registry, for example. And then you're like, well, what can I do with that? We will grow it with you. So it's not just going to be a case of here you go and you get no support. We do the publications, the posters, we come to the conferences with you, we present at your conferences, we give yearly updates. We suggest where, where we can move to the next step but on an agreement with the steering committee. Again, it's not pulse driving the agenda, it is everyone driving the agenda. I mean, for me, it always says she sees us as Switzerland, completely neutral in terms of this, the decision-making side of things. And that's kind of what we would look at. And then we go into cost. Costing literally comes down to how many patient groups are involved and how we split it out. So we could be looking at, so we say, when we look at the very simple uh, starter pack registry, we look at like 10 to 5,000 a year, and that's it. When we look at the accelerated one, it costs more, but the, the actual impact on costs will be reduced because you'll have more than one group involved. But I'd have to, we'd have to cost it out based on how many groups would be interested. So we could be looking, for example, between 40 to 50K a year, but then, or even less, maybe 35, 40, 50. But then if you have four, five, six groups involved, that split is much less as it goes on. And then we can keep adding people into registry. And as we add more people in, the costs may either drop 
or if they increase, that's where we bring industry in. But no, there would be no like increase in, in their in sort of cost or anything without everyone understanding what the implication would be. And that's again where the industry partners are important. When we start adding in different modules to the platform, they pay for it. You guys don't pay for it. That's the whole point is that industry sponsor those future developments because they get what they need from it and they will get historical data, which is what they need, and a platform ready built, what they need, access to patients, you've got them in your registry, an engaged community, you're working with them already. So that saves them nine, 12 months on their kind of development process because it's there sitting there in front of them. And then they think, right, we can write a check for X amount to do that rather than do the hard work, which is paying for a provider, staff time to kind of all the meetings to develop it and stuff is already exists. They just need to put the sponsorship model in place. And that's something that industry have no issue in doing. Daniel, have you got examples that one can use for this? Because to be honest, it's mm. going to be a big selling job, isn't it, for us to find <laughs> other people? And if you've got a story we can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can share some examples. Let me share, for example, the CDK5 model we've put in place. The, NK, um, the NKF has been very successful on that side in terms of that producing their registries much bigger in terms of because of chronic kidney disease. But the sponsorship of that registry has been very successful because the data has been captured and industries see the benefits to it. We've got our, um, our um, melanoma registry, for example, again, are very successful and we expand them out every time we get the sponsors involved. And that's the whole point. We don't commit to anything until we get the funding approved by industry to expand out so we can increase the patient numbers and also what data we're collecting. You know, for that, we're now looking at bringing in um, AI to look at medical records and are uploaded to pull out to commonalities there. So these these functionalities are available, but at a cost, and that cost mm -hmm. should be going back out to um, to industry. Mm -hmm. I'm quite interested. So to get started on the sort of contact database, just so I've got this straight in my head, we're talking about five to ten k a year. But to be shared amongst no if you were to that would be just for one group around about 10k a year for one group yeah but if we moved to the accelerated one you get more modules preset at the beginning but the cost would be reduced because you have four or five people involved in it so it kind of brings it down okay so we would need to find as ring 20 if we wanted to go for this for example we would need to find ten thousand per annum to have the contact yeah. database yeah. Around that, yeah. That's a big ask. Ask. that's a big ask for us. Big every, ask. every year. We might find it one year. We might, yeah. I'm not sure we could afford to find it every year because I don't know where we get that funding from mm -hmm. because it wouldn't come through. We, we wouldn't get that amount through family fundraising. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be too much of an ask. And we don't have the contacts with industry and typical sort of grant funders yeah. don't fund research medical research you know it's quite restricted as you're probably very much aware of yeah. um yeah. so i think that's my big concern to start yeah. off with yeah and and for groups not that's just with the ring 20 hat on but i know you know we're so, a reasonably well established smaller group there are others that are even smaller than than, than us mm. um okay. So for that, we need to explore them. We need to explore where we could look at funding. Are there, you know, if we're doing it for more than one group, so you're doing it for five or six as a collaborative, is there an ability to, to apply for group funding from one, one, um, one funder, either here in the UK or in Europe, the Europe, well, if we can still apply for European level grants, that sort of thing, who may be more willing to do it. Or industry again is looking at industry as a, as a funder or a combination. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean whether yeah, industry yeah. would be interested. I don't know if you looked at some of the. I don't know. Let's just pick say GW Pharma with, um, uh, you know, if dialects, you know, that they're offering to two or three. Or well, in fact, they're looking at tuberous cirrhosis now, so the third. Um, you know, epilepsy-based um, medication, you know, would 
they or somebody like the Zagenics that are going through the trials of Fenfluramin for the, for the couple of big epilepsy driver and LGS currently, yeah. you know, would industry like those sort of pharma be interested in helping to fund a rare epilepsy database that captured a wider group of epilepsies for future potential, for future potential, you know, research and clinical trials that they might want to go into. Uh, as you say, like basket trials, or, or, you know, wider cohorts than the traditional cohorts that they always go to, which is Dravet and LGS. Because yeah. we know the only reason they go to those cohorts, well, main reason, is because registries already exist for those cohorts. So we're kind of in that catch-22 yeah. of you can't get on the wheel because you haven't got enough money. Once you've got the money, it perpetuates. Yeah. But you're kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm guessing, and this is this is something we've talked about in Ring Twenty. The big, the big catch twenty two here is numbers, numbers of patients, because only when you get more numbers does do do the does industry become interested. That's the, that as far as I can see is the big, the big issue, and that's why I was wondering whether we can show demonstrate that if you do bring together the different groups and you can actually demonstrate larger numbers does it does that in itself sway people and make it more of greater interest it does again look at my experience in tay sachs we you know we're one in three hundred and twenty thousand. we get two to six new diagnoses here in the uk we put a register together and then when we got to over 100 patients i said no then we'll start looking at industry to involvement I remember speaking to someone and they were like, so you've got natural history data for the last five years. So people who were born um, before 2015 who were still alive with the disease or born after 2015. So you still had to be living to be in the registry. Um, and they're like, look, you are, we had 135 at the time. They're like, that's a crazy amount of data. We would have, if you had 25 people, we'd be interested. They don't need huge numbers. They just need consistent, consistently good information. That's what they will use. Okay. Now, we had full data across those who passed away, those who are living, the different variants. We kept the mutations. We kept the common symptoms and stuff like that. And that, you know, they said 25 people would have been enough. And I've been holding out to wait to hit, hit 100. Wow. <laughs> so I started marketing around. They were like, that's a crazy level of data. And it didn't exist anywhere. So you don't need to worry so much about having hundreds of people in there. You just need to keep that consistent information within a structured database that's kind of the yeah. key okay mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm wondering how if we could get beyond the cost barrier how the natural history you know that we we want to start as you know a natural history oh. study um oh. with the university and they were thinking of a database because they were going to collect clinical records, medical history of yeah. up to 100 patients. That's what we were hoping to, to obtain. Um, we said to them, we want this to be a true patient registry, but we were looking to fund the whole, you know, the natural history study and the, and the work they were looking to do. Yeah. Um, they'd originally envisaged, you know, creating a, a research database that they looked after and we said, well, hold on a minute. If we're yeah. funding it as Ring 20, we want access to this data. Yeah, we, want yeah. to be able to use this. we don't just want one publication two years yeah. down the line and you go and, and pay for you to go and stand at a conference and, yeah. and that's it. You know, yeah. we want to be able to use and build on that data set. Um, it, it can't sit and gather dust um, in your university. And so that's why we're kind of thinking, you know, is this an optimum time to be thinking about this? Um, but I, I'm guessing to sort of that's the bit that's a add-on module which even increases the cost further and I'm trying to think that this is beyond no it depends what information they want to capture that that for us it'd be interesting to know what they want to capture in the system because you'd be saving a huge a lot of work because that one platform kind of meets the needs of everyone yeah so we could I mean we could the look sort of it. data would be your typical you know what types of seizures do you have? When did your seizures start? Um, well, yeah, what kind of treatments that. have you been on? 
historically and in the future what are your comorbidities you know yeah. you're, you're kind of your uh, but from the medical records to corroborate or build on what the patient families report themselves because okay. what I've heard from several patient advocacy groups is that when you have patient reported data it can be a little bit you, you need to sometimes verify it which I find a bit interesting when you're saying does somebody not know their day of birth <laughs> and, and, and things like that but I've been told by other groups you'll be amazed at what rubbish the families input into these when they're right. asked a question because they don't always understand the question they don't always get the response that you want but which is why you have to get the doc you know even down to when did your seizures start if yeah. you ask for a date the family might give one date but actually if you go back to their medical records it might be different mm. how important that's going to be you know it's probably going to be within a similar time frame mm -hmm. is my guess you know but um, I guess the question is, can we persuade the university to use a different database? Or do they, are they going to be very proprietary about it? Yeah. I think they're open. So the University of um, Isla was supposed to be joining us today to hear a little bit. She was very interested to hear about this. So I will share the recording. Um, my understanding was, you know, they were open to an appropriate database um but my concern is about funding yeah that because unless the yeah. university can help contribute to that funding there is i don't think it's within our our reach to extend but surely that we're saving i mean if they're not using their own facilities and they're not doing well i suppose they're still doing data input they're just putting it into a different place but there is a cost saving Attached yeah, to, to, to build that database, yeah, if they need to build it from scratch or even take a similar, similar one and and. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's obviously yeah, something for discussion. Yeah. Mm. We we can have a chat with them if you want to set it up. I can go into a bit more detail on that side of things, but yeah, it's just about you know, I said to you before, like, the, unfortunately, these things do cost money. Because yeah. the unit, you're, you're storing data, though, in the right regs ready format. A lot of work's gone on behind the scenes to make that happen and the ability to expand it out. Um, for us, it's all about making sure you, it maximises use of the data. Again, so it doesn't sit in a database that isn't used or is published right. from once. We want it to be regularly published from, from our selfish needs as organisations. We want to, people to know that the Pulse platform is being used in these different therapeutic areas and we publish off it. Um, hence why we have the data science team to do all of that for us. Uh, I, I'm also really interested in this common data elements. Yeah. And that's where we start bringing in other organisations, other, other diseases. So, I mean, in, in a sense, our, our current project is just a very, is the start. Because you're not going to be able to get anything in terms of commonalities unless you've got other people putting data in. Yeah, well, common data elements are just the data items that you collect across the board that everybody on the database provides, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the disease. So this is something that we're doing within Epicare, uh, within the European database that we're currently building. So, and that conforms, there are certain um, European standards that the EJPRD have um, developed, and there's about 20, 25 common data elements, elements across all rare diseases. And it's things like um, date of birth, gender, um, when disease onset, what's the name of your diagnosis? You know, are you alive? Um, you know, it's really pretty, Basic. Basic stuff. Is the pulse CDs, does that go beyond that before you get to the disease yeah. specific? Yeah, then we start drilling it down to a bit more detail. But that's then where the data dictionary defines exactly what CDs are going to be. And that's why the idea of having this cross epilepsy registry would make sure that we collect CDEs across everyone. Mm -hmm. And then when you eventually get to those disease specific questions, it could be three or four, there won't be very many. 
but you all the other underlying data will allow for cross disease analysis, which I think will be important going forward. Because there's no point us all keeping things termed in different ways or phrased in different ways. Keep it nice, simple and structured makes it much easier as well for analysis. Mm. I mean, I, I could see huge benefits because although the, for example, the Epicare registry, which is, you know, the aim is to collate um, patient data um, on all rare epilepsy patients across Europe, which includes those within the UK. Um, they are only going to collect data from the 28 ERN centres around Europe. So in the UK, for example, they're only from hospitals. Well, they're, they're not even designated ERN anymore because we're not allowed to be because of Brexit, but um, they, they will still collect the data at Great Ormond Street and, and Glasgow and Oxford and um, the National. But so what I know, and this has been my concern, is that the majority of rare epilepsy patients aren't seen at an ERN centre because there isn't the concept of when you get diagnosed with X, you get sent to send specialist centre Y to for your tertiary, you know, very specialised treatment. You, the majority of patients, I mean, for Ring20, and I, I'm assuming it's pretty similar for any other rare epilepsy, even if you're a complex case, you're still treated locally at your local hospital. Um, so, you know, unless you become extra complicated, you're not often referred to a, a even more specialist, you know, as a child being, you know, they, do, they don't see everybody at Great Ormond Street, for example. Yeah. Um, so we will never know the, you know, through the Epicare and the ERM registry, we will never know the scale of the problem, even in contact database mm. of people living with these rare epilepsies. If we could develop something here within the UK, through the UK Rare, that captured, you know, that basic information across many, many more of the epilepsies because people are being treated at these local hospitals, how much more powerful would that data be? The thing is that Epicare, as you know, Dan, PRNs, um, are EU funded and minimally funded, and there, there's not likely there's not going to be any funding coming from the EU Commission to help with this. Um, it's but is that something that is another sell to try and sell to, to industry to say, hey, you know, we could feed into something like that because there the opportunity is interoperability um, yeah. and integration, isn't it? Of, of these databases so that you know exactly. you can connect. You don't collect the data twice, you connect the databases. Yes. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it. And actually I was speaking to um, someone about newborn screening the other day and they're asking, you know, what's the thing to always consider about that? And they said, you, you do need prevalence data. If you don't have prevalence data, they're never gonna look at you in newborn screening, which takes you back to the whole point of the registry. You can get decent, prevalence data that you can use you're on a winner already because that's always a question that's going to come up for reimbursement when they look at you know paying for treatments and stuff like that what's the prevalence rate if you don't have anything you say oh one of three hundred twenty thousand. that publication says 100 one of 200 000, and that says one in 100 then think, well, no one knows what is mm -hmm. the number and you will have the data to back up that number which is why it goes back to planning early mm -hmm. so when you need it it exists and you don't run with these roadblocks that other groups have been unfortunately experiencing as they go along that journey. Have any rare diseases done this? Yeah, yeah, in using pulse. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. so that's CDKL5, for example. I'll send you about that, but that's where we worked for the Lulu Foundation and the um out in the US as well, an orphan disease center to set up the registry there. And it's been successful. And they're now bringing in, they're now brought in lots of different pharma partners to develop new endpoints. Did they have this same issue around prevalence? Did, did they have? Did, did they start from a similar place? Yes. Yeah. From they did. From like they it's like, what do you do? How yeah. do you do it? And yeah. They're, they're luckily that they, they have good funding, so they could put something in place. Where did their funding come from? They uh, have a very um, <laughs> you might say it more eloquently than I do. <laughs> uh, one, one some... of, yeah, one of uh, the. One of the parents is um, very well connected um, with a high power job and right. uh, incredibly well. Very, so it was, very, was it sort of philanthropic? 
funding. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 which exists but in the, the US and doesn't really exist in Europe in the same way. Yeah. Not at all. This is always our struggle, but yeah, working with industry is something we do at Pulse anyway. So bringing in industry partners again, we're, we're confident we can always bring them in to sponsor mm-hmm. a registry because we can sell the product to them, but. Rather than selling them the concept, we have to sell them something that already exists, which is why yeah. they're starting something up. Exactly. And then they start sponsoring it. You start getting revenue shares. You start getting sustainable income based off the registry. You're on a winner. So that's kind of that, how we're looking at it. But we have to, like I said before, it's going to have to get start because, again, I've seen lots of groups just sit in the corner waiting and waiting, and they either miss the opportunity, someone else does it in mm. another place, and then they don't have access to the data or they can't use it or it's not even in a good system and unfortunately all too common is a register will be set up on a platform that really isn't fit for purpose and either shuts down or and it's all lost it's not, yeah yeah lost. no I I, 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 get, I totally get it the whole I get the whole picture yeah. I'm just really wondering because okay so we know it exists and we know it was funded philanthropically which we don't have and so that is basically the challenge. I mean, I think we see the benefits. We see mm. what could be done. We do. Yeah. Ca- question is, is that a story we can set? That's what I said to you. It's a big selling job. Is this a mm. story? And the NHS currently has so many other priorities, let's face mm. it. So even yeah. if you got the odd individual within those hospitals that might be interested and, and get the big picture, which, you mm. know, I let's face it, there are many... In- you know, good people in the NHS, would they have capacity, mental capacity, time capacity, resource capacity, even to consider it at the moment? Or is our timing really, I don't know, I'm just, vo- I'm being devil's advocate here. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, Dan, in terms of like the, the horizon, you know, for treatments and epilepsy in general, is, it, is there a need for this? Are we looking at kind of lots of things coming to market in the next kind of few years? In, in terms of the existing pipelines? Yeah, the pipelines. There is a big... So you, your, your mic's not working. Bring it closer. No, no, no. Sorry. That's all right. Can't hear you. Right, is that better now? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few kind of emerging treatments coming through, especially in the next couple of years. And I know the BPNA are looking at um, holding a conference in the not too distant future, hopefully, um, with emerging treatments as, as its focus. Um, so I don't know whether it would be worth getting in touch with them at this stage. So I'm I'm in contact. So, so would that be separate to their annual conference or part of the annual conference? Yeah, no, it'd be a separate separate conference. Yeah, I think it's come about because they're they're kind of under increasing increasing pressure around um, cannabis based medicinal products, um, and the idea is they want to show that there's a lot of other things kind of coming out in the pipeline that would be um, an alternative. Hmm. So that would be really really interesting. So you know, obviously I I'm connected. Yeah, as you are, we're connected with Philippa, um, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, it, I mean, I'm aware. You know, there's stuff that Confluramin's coming through. There's, there's other stuff. There was a whole slide of stuff I saw earlier this year. There's stuff coming through trials, and I'm sure you've, there's probably other stuff emerging pre-trial as uh, as well. Um, and and last year they were talking about a, a cannabis based trials that were supposed to be happening this summer, which I don't think I've seen anything of, have they? Um, no. But non epidiolytics going to be non epidiolytics but um, you, you're absolutely right, you know, if the world doesn't revolve around the cannabis space, you know, we're just looking for people with intractable epilepsy, you know, looking for different alternative options, whatever they might be, um, you know, potential for effective treatment. Um, I mean, obviously, that if, if we know where these emerging treatments are potentially coming from, then maybe does that give us an opportunity to engage with pharma that will be behind those initiatives yeah. and to, yeah. 
talk collectively to them and say, hey, you know, we'd like to do something about this to, to, to help you and to help us, our, the families that we represent. Um, um, does that kind of, would that make sense? Is that... That's an approach we could look at, is then the other idea is to scope out the entire project. This is what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. Before we engage, before we actually do something, we go out to industry and then we get those groups involved and see if there's a funding opportunity there. That's the other way of doing it. Obviously, the risk you run there is you don't have anything to show them, just a concept, but we can price out accordingly. That may be a bit better. What we need to know is kind of who the who the companies are what their treatments what they're looking at the pipeline timings and stuff and then we tailor our kind of presentations and we get co-sponsorship again that's a route we've taken before and we can do it's kind of what what serves you best as a community i guess the more imminent question for us i mean that's a slightly that's sort of like a medium-term project doing mm -hmm. that our more immediate concern i think is what to do about glasgow Mm. So, I, I, yeah. yeah, I'd hate to think that we we think this, for example, we think if we think this is a good idea, but we think we can't afford it at this mm. point in time, you know, or particularly on an ongoing basis, ongoing commitment basis. Um, if we went in a different direction with Glasgow because we want to get moving with Glasgow. Yeah. Are we scuppering ourselves because yeah. is it a wasted opportunity really that's the thing yeah mm. so the, not wasted in that you could ingest the data at a later date the problem is if you have patient engagement the issue you have is you lose patient um, confidence if they're being asked to supply their information because they go from one system and they say now we need you to reconsent into this new system yeah it's better blah 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 and they're well i've done it once you'll get drop off you know, there's no you won't get 100 yeah. percent sign up yeah that's always the risk you run but it's kind of what the priority is going to be it might be worth our while to have the conversation with glasgow on the costings given that we're funding it we have the opportunity to negotiate with them about it yeah whether they've got any opportunity for funding from other sources or what about I don't know, Dan, Dan, you, what, what, what about something like Epilepsy Research UK? I mean, you know, is that a, is that a route? We should, you know, should I speak to Maxine about this as a concept and say, you know, because we're not just talking about Ring 20, we'd, we'd be oh, saying no. doing this for Re rare epilepsies. Rare, rare epilepsies. Exactly. Um, what know. about the NIHR? Um, I definitely think um, epilepsy research would be worth worth approaching. Um, I'm not sure about N NIHR, um, whether this would be something they would fund or not. Um, but again, it, it's, it's probably worth at least asking the asking the question of them. Yeah, I've got contacts there as well in the viral resource unit. Um, um, because we were going to try and pick up a ring chromosome rare disease cohort, but you know, there's things like there's the NCARD RS, so the National Genetic yeah. Rare Disease, but, um, and and well, that's just England. Then you've got the Scottish, and, blah, 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 and they're not even joined up, and they don't even collect on every rare disease either. So you know, we had to do a self patient self reporting portal, and I don't think that really took off very very well with them so we know nationally within our uh even within the english health systems you know we're very we're not collecting any this data is not no. does not exist no so we're doing a huge if we were to go this route it 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 would be hugely beneficial it would mm. but i don't think it should be up to patient organisations to fund that. No. Um, because, but, I think, but we can yeah. pose, I think we can pose the question. And we, not only are we posing the question, we're offering a solution. Mm. 
Yeah. We're posing a question, we're raising the issue, and we're providing a potential solution. It's not as if we're just saying, hey, guys, you're not doing it right. No. Um, so, I mean, one could put together a, a carefully worded letter, email, whatever it is, and send it around to a few of these places and see what response we get. With your help, I think, Daniel. To, to talk about the database and its benefits. And that, yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. And I think it, even looking at industry as well to speak to them, to to get their their kind of appetite in terms of funding is, is yeah. a good idea. I think we well. need to kind of, and I think we should do it sooner rather than later because it might influence what we do with Glasgow. So we kind of do need to do it. Mm. And it could be a model, you know, if, you, if we could make this work for the rare epilepsies, be a model for other rare diseases. Exactly. Skin diseases, blood diseases, yeah. liver diseases. Even you know, rare cancers or, you know, yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Any, any of those. Um, yeah. If it's a model that, that, that well, works. We've got our, our, one of our cancer registries is a rare cancer for uveal melanoma, cutaneous, it's for quite a few rare cancers. And it's based on the same concept of those rare oncology CDEs. And then we get more disease specific as we go on, but it's all kept within that single database. So again, yeah, this is what we've done. Well, I think we need to, sh I think we need, that's what we need to explain. We need those <laughs> examples, but short, sharp, you know, yep. mark marketing style examples. Yeah, yeah well, I've got those, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to include those and say, hey guys, this exists in other areas and this is what we'd like to do. And we have an opportunity kick to kickstart it. Mm. Through the through the rear through the, class, through the yeah collaborative you know the, the UK rep that we we've, we've set up you know we're joining up these patient organisations that exist within the if UK. we don't ask we won't get I think it's mm. it's you know we lose we lose nothing by asking I mean it's a little bit of time but not massive mm. I think it's worth a go mm. isn't it yeah and That's actually like five or ten grand in other people's world is not a lot of money you know that's the thing it's huge for us but in the mm. in the overall scheme of things it's not huge no um yeah it's yeah when you're talking industry and pharma it's, yeah it's yeah. not a lot of money so actually and i think we can even say you know we're not asking we it's 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 seed funding is what we're looking for isn't it mm -hmm. so how about, just wondering about the RSA I've got contacts in the RSA and they know they know about me in health related stuff that's another one we could try never know you just never know that's good that sounds good I, I think like the actions from from my side I'll share the presentation and the case studies I'll have a chat with the guys internally but it could be we put a little project plan on what we're looking at trying to do and yeah. then we we look at the most appropriate ways in terms of funding. And I think you guys speak to the Glasgow team. Um, and then maybe if we get like a, a pipeline list of what's coming up from the rare space, we can start looking at who would be an attractive person to contact or who would be a good opportunity for us to contact someone to kind of sponsor the registry. No, I definitely think it's it's worth exploring because I think the, the concept is absolutely sound. It is. It is, it is a gap. Um, it's just, how do we make it happen? Exactly. Is it, is it, <laughs> um, but I, but I, I just think, you know, we may, as well give it a sh we may as well give it a go, rather than saying, oh no, we can't do it, forget it. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's of sufficient interest and value that we should give it a go. Mm, and we need sure. to be a bit lucky. Yeah. And, and I, the other thing that's just jumping into my head is, you know, if we do get somebody that bites and says, OK, we agree, it's a great idea, tell me more. Yeah. We start a conversation, you know, are they going to say, well, give me three alternative providers? Mm. Compare and contrast. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the competition. I'm just being kind of open. Yeah, here, yeah. Dan, but, you know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the course. sort of thing that's... that they're going to they're gonna ask. And, and I... You know, I just think, again, all of this is a huge amount of work. I mean, I'm, we have a vested interest as Ring 20 on a, our own siloed, but I, yeah. I want this as a bigger 
you know, yeah, it's yeah. a bigger project because I think there's benefits to all of us. Yeah. Um, but it, it starts to become too much to take on for a voluntary organisation to to try and make this happen for for UK rare epilepsies. And that's where I I don't know Epilepsy Action or Epilepsy Society or Epilepsy Research UK can kind of come in and kind of help mm. a bit here because you know this is if, if we want to drive this through and make something happen, you know, it's going to take time and commitment uh, and, and, a, and a lot of selling and we're yeah. going to need going to need some help. Yeah. With this. Yeah, and resource. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm certainly happy to help where, where I can, yeah. Um, and it might be worth, once we've got the kind of case studies and the presentation, just um, sending it round again um, and maybe looking at setting up a, another meeting between us. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Well, I think we've got, we've got some very good initial thoughts that stimulated... <laughs> stimulated you know um yeah. good thinking so thank you very much dan for um you know no talking to us today i don't think this is the end of a conversation i think this sparked some interest um yeah. and we just need to see what what potential we can go for forward with so yeah. um, no, that sounds thank good you all very much for your time today i appreciate we've gone over but i think it's quite a rich discussion thanks everyone lovely to meet Thanks. you all yep you too Bye. see you soon Bye. See you later. Bye-bye.